Hi, class. Dr. Jim here. We're on to chapter 12. And so chapter 12 is looking at antimicrobial therapy. And so really it's the antibiotics. We're going to be talking about the antibiotics today in this lecture, but we also include things that are for fungal infections, viral infections, and then even some helmets or worms and protozoa infections. So we kind of cover the whole gambit of different types of drugs that you would take to fight off an infection. Primarily, we're going to be talking about antibiotics. And in those antibiotics, there's really two main types of antibiotics that we're going to be looking at. Ones that affect the cell wall and the other ones that affect the 70S ribosomes. So if we think about what's different about bacteria compared to what is with our cells, we know that bacteria have cell walls and they have the 70S ribosomes. And so that's where you're going to see a majority of your drugs. Probably about 90% of all antimicrobials are going to be targeting either cell wall or the 70S ribosome. So it's a good percentage there of what we go because we don't have them, so they're not going to be toxic to us. So let's take a look and see what we're going to be looking at today and then kind of go through some of the history of antimicrobials and then talk specifically about what each one is. All right, so first we're going to look at is what are antimicrobials and what are the effective ranges of the drug use. So we're talking about either a narrow spectrum versus a broad spectrum. Narrow spectrum means that you only affect a certain amount of uh, bacteria or bugs, okay? So we'll say that maybe it only affects E. coli or maybe only the gram negatives, where a broad spectrum is going to cover a large number of bacteria. So this would be both gram positive, gram negative, uh, very large, or you might say all bacilli or something like that. So that would be a broad range. And so we look at those differences and some drugs are very good at killing one thing and some are good at killing lots of things. And so obviously that plays a role when you would use it for treatment. Another thing we're going to look at are what are the different targets. And again, we've talked about this already in chapter 11. In chapter 11, we had a couple of different things, cell walls, cell membranes, proteins, DNA, and RNA. And there's going to be one other thing we add in this, and this is going to be binding to cells. And so that's really with a viral type of situation. And again, we'll talk about how they work. We'll do, then we'll talk a little bit about how bacteria get resistance. And again, this came up already. We talked about it in, in the genetics, and that is conjugation, transformation, and transduction. So that's how they get the DNA or the genes to get resistance. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the other types of resistance they get from the genes themselves. Either they make thicker cell walls, they develop protein pumps that pump antibiotics out, they might produce thicker glycocalyxes, things like this. And so we'll look at all these different things. And then finally, we'll look at how do we measure bacterial resistance to antimicrobials. We'll be doing this in the lab. It's called the Kirby-Bauer method. That's one way. There are also a few other methods that we can use in the lab that allow us to measure how effective an antibiotic is going to be towards someone, a patient. So you can take a patient sample and test them, or you can look over a wide range and see that. So we'll look at this as well. So we'll look at some of the testing that's involved too. All right, so what are the, principal, the principles of antimicrobial therapy? And that's basically to give a drug to an infected person that's going to kill the agent but not kill you. So that's the object of having any type of drug. You want a drug to target the infection, and it kills the infection where it saves your life, okay? And again, these drugs are a lot of times now made synthetically, but original the original derivative came from natural sources, either bacteria uh, fungi or other sources in the environment. So we'll look at how these things came about here in just a minute. Okay, here are the characteristics for the ideal drugs, and you can kind of go through and these make a lot of sense. And again, I'm not going to ask a lot of questions on these things. I mean, you can use just common sense and kind of think about what would make a good drug, but we'll go through these things. And again, don't memorize all these things and everything else, but I would really want you to think common sense wise, what would you think would make a really good drug to take and what would make a poor drug, okay? And that basically are the rules of the different types of drugs. So the first one is selectively toxic to the microbe, but not toxic to cells, that makes sense, okay? You want the kill the microbe, not kill your cells. You want it to be microbicidal rather than static. What this is, is it means it kills bacteria, so you get bacteria death rather than just keep it at a normal level. And so you really want to kill the bacteria rather than just keep them from growing and getting any bigger in population. Uh, relatively soluble, so obviously, so it can get into body fluids and tissues so it doesn't get too diluted. Remains potent, so you don't have to take dose after dose after dose. 
doesn't lead to the development of resistance. This is obviously a big thing now that we don't want resistant bacteria. We don't want to introduce a drug and then already have it resistant to a number of different strains. Again, works with the immune system. We're going to be talking about the immune system in the next unit coming up. And so obviously we'll look at some of the different features of those things. Again, remains active in the tissues. Body fluid is delivered to the site of infection. So you don't want to take a pill and then not get to the site of infection. You want to be able to get that drug to where it needs to go to fight. So if you take it intramuscularly or IV, you want to make sure that it gets to where the infection needs to be. Obviously, this is a big one. It's got to be reasonably priced. You're not going to pay hundreds and thousands of dollars for a drug to try and kill an infection. I mean, I guess if you were trying to save a life, you would look at that and say maybe cost is no option. But really, most of us are thinking, hey, if we have a, you know, a skin infection or something else, we want something that we can take that's going to do a really good job. That's a reasonable cost. Okay. And then finally, we don't want other things occurring, obviously disrupting. We want we don't want to damage tissues. We don't want to cause allergies or anything else. And we'll look at all these different things as you talk about it. So again, it's pretty much common sense. You want a drug that's going to kill the infection, not kill you, one that's cheap, okay, one that's going to be able to survive in the areas so that it gets to the site in the infection. You want to make sure that it, you know, it's um able to help with the host defenses. And obviously you don't want any side effects to go along with it. And so all these things play a huge role in whether you take a drug or not. And so, you know, common sense. All right, and here is some of the terminology. Again, we're gonna be talking about some of these things again and again, but uh, the chemotherapeutic drug is any chemical that's used in relief of disease. Prophylaxis means a drug to prevent potential infection. Uh, antimicrobial chemotherapy is basically to control an infection. Antibiotics, this is used for bacteria primarily. We call these antibiotics. Antimicrobials is for almost anything else, so it encompasses everything. Antibiotics is normally when we discuss thinking about bacteria. Okay, uh, Semi-synthetic drugs means that partially made in the lab. They may have been a natural derivative that had been modified in the lab. Synthetic is completely man-made. Okay, and then we talked about narrow versus broad. Narrow spectrum is going to be a small range of bacteria or viruses where broad is going to be a very large strain okay, or a large thing. Okay, and the example they give here I like for the narrow would be only gram-positive bacteria where a broad spectrum would be both gram-positive and gram-negative. So that, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so where did, where did uh, antibiotics come from or antimicrobials? So antibiotics were uh, common metabolic products of aerobic bacteria and fungi, and this is because it's all about space. So if you are fighting with another organism for the same spot, let's say you both wanted the same land, okay? Then you wanted to put your house on that land. And so the, essentially you're gonna have to either fight for it, arm wrestle, or do something for it. In the bacterial world, what happens is that microbes will release chemicals to kill the uh, other organism that wants their space. So these are antimicrobials. This is where we found out. Now, really, we, we knew that there were things in, in these different microbes in that that could kind of limit the uh, growth of certain things, but we really didn't know how to isolate it. We really didn't know how these things work. Now, the first scientist to really have any uh, information about this was Alexander, Alexander Fleming, and he found this in the late 1920s. He was a microbiologist. Uh, he served in World War One, and he noticed how many, how many soldiers were actually dying of infection rather than dying on the battlefield, and it was much more from infection than on the battlefield. And these uh, antiseptics weren't really doing the job. They're actually doing more harm than good. So he was really looking for a way to find uh, substance that would kill these microbes to prevent infection and then go on to uh, kill these soldiers. And so the idea behind his was a way to um, maintain the population, keep them healthy so that they could go on and fight in other things. Okay. And so that, that was his research looking at those things. And one of the things he found, and it was by accident. Okay. And I have a video for you on the next slide that you can watch this whole thing. But essentially was, is he was pretty dirty in his lab and he went on a vacation, essentially. They call it a holiday in Britain, but he went on vacation. And essentially a month later, he came back to look at all his plates and all his plates had mold growing all over it. And so all these strains of bacteria that he struck out on these plates now have mold all over them. 
What he didn't realize when he was about ready to toss them was that that mold was inhibiting the bacteria from growing. And he was like, hmm, this is an interesting observation. And so what he did was he took the mold and basically ground it up and made a juice out of it. And they called it mold juice or mold liquid. And he would treat it on different bacteria. And he noticed that there was something in the mold juice that would actually kill these bacteria. And so that's essentially how he discovered the antibiotics. He set and purified this mold juice and he figured out that it was this penicillin or basically this antibiotic that he was uh, getting out of this mold penicillium. And so that's where penicillin came from. And so we credit Alexander Fleming for really discovering the first antibiotic. Shortly thereafter, once he published his work, many other antibiotics were found. And we know from that day, so from about the mid-1930s till now, we've had antibiotics to help fight infections. However, with the growing resistance, we're finding that this could be, we could be going back to before 1930 again without antibiotics, and that could be a very scary thing. All right, so here's Alexander Fleming's discovery. Again, it's about a five-minute video. I think it's a really neat video. It kind of talks about what I just said, but with pictures and other things. gives you a little background to why he wanted to find these things, and I think it's a really good video for you guys to take a look at. So definitely recommend it. Take a look at this and kind of enjoy it. So pause this video and watch that one. I think you'll get a real kick out of it. All right, here are some of the strains of both bacteria and mold. And you can see most of them are molds that we got these things from, but there's also bacteria in there. And here are the drugs that we found. So a lot of these drugs that we use every day are taken from natural sources. And that was important because we wanted to do it naturally. These are natural drugs that are going to kill inhibitors or people or antagonists that are trying to get for the same space. And they work really well. Unfortunately, what's happened is overexposure to these chemicals has allowed for these bacteria to make resistance to a lot of these drugs. And so we'll look at that as well later on. So you can see lots of the antibiotics that we have that we use come from natural sources. And so again, natural versus synthetic versus semi-synthetic. All right, so when we look at the interactions between the drug and microbe, obviously we want it selectively toxic. We want to kill the pathogen and not kill you. That's the goal, okay? And again, we have to look at the characteristics of the infectious agent compared to the vertebrate host cell and look for differences. We can find differences, we can target those, and that's what we're going to use to kill the microbes and not kill us, okay? So what are the two main differences that bacteria have that we don't? The cell wall and then the 70S ribosomes. So those are gonna be a big deal. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at today. All right, so here's the mechanisms of drug action. And okay, so the first one, like I said, cell wall inhibitors. I would say about 60%, 60 to 70% of all our antibiotics that we take as a drug taking nation is gonna be against the cell wall. Again, not a lot of toxicity because you don't have cell walls, so you don't worry about this. Now, it could affect some other things and cause some side effects with your kidneys or liver, but for the most part, these drugs are relatively safe. They're going to target the bacteria, especially those that have really thick cell walls. So you can see these include penicillin, cephalosporins, vancomycin, bacitracin, monobactams, phosphomycin, uh, cycloserine, and azonazine. Okay, these are all very common, well-known drugs, and they all target the cell wall inhibitors. And you've probably taken one of these forms, especially one of the illins. And so one of the illins, like amoxicillin, ampicillin, and that, those are going to be cell wall inhibitors. Okay, the second one is cell membrane. Again, not very many. These are called polymyxins. So it's a rare drug because it has a lot of side effects because there's not a lot of difference between their bacteria cell membranes and ours. So there's more toxicity issues. DNA and RNA, these are tough too because, again, we both have DNA and RNA. And so some of the things you can go after are certain enzymes that they have. So the gyrases, the quinolones, which is ciprofloxin, and then RNA polymerase, which is rifampin. So these are all targets to go after, um, again, either bacteria or viruses. And so we'll see some of that as well. Now, like I said, another big group, about 30% of our antibiotics is going to target the proteins. And so what we do is we go after the subunits. Now, remember, prokaryotes have a different set of subunits. In eukaryotes, we have the 40 and 60 that make the 80. In prokaryotes, they have the 30 and 50, which makes the 70. And so you can see that a number of our drugs target these different subunits. And again, they're less toxic 
because again, we don't have these ribosomes. The one caveat to that is that our mitochondria have 70S ribosomes. So over time, this could lead to toxicity issues. So that, that's one of the reasons why there are certain drugs you can only take for a certain amount of time because it does lead to more toxicity. The last group is the metabolic pathways. And again, we'll talk about this. Uh, one of the main pathways that bacteria need is to make folic acid, to make DNA and RNA, and we can actually block the production of folic acid in bacteria. And this is used through sulfonamides. And so sulfonamides are another form of drugs that will actually use to block pathways. And we'll talk about this as well as we go through. So for the next couple, I would say the next 20 slides or so, we're going to be looking at all the different modes of action. We're going to take a look at some of the drugs and other things. And really, I don't care if you know about the exact types of drugs and that stuff. I just want you to understand the targets and how those targets are affected by these drugs. Okay, so if we talk about penicillins, you're going to know penicillins are targeting the cell wall that they destroy the linkages between the cell wall and causes it to be leaky. Or if you're talking about any of the uh, ones that target the subunits, okay, they target protein synthesis, they stop protein synthesis because you affect the ribosome, the ribosome can't come together, you can't make protein, thus you can't grow and divide. Okay, so that's kind of what we're looking at in the next few slides. Okay, here again are a number of the different drugs. They talk about the targets and the lysis of cells. And again, I'm not going to expect you to know specific drugs or anything else. We'll talk a lot about the different spe uh, specific drugs. But again, I'm not worried that you remember those. I want you to understand the different kinds of families of drugs and what they do. Okay, so if we're talking about penicillins and cephalosporins, where do they target? Or if I talk aminoglycosides, those target proteins or things like this. And this will make a lot more sense as we go along. So again, if you have any questions, just send me an email. I'll be happy to answer it for you. Okay, so again, we talked a little bit about the narrow versus broad. The narrow spectrum is a small amount of microbes. And again, these target a specific cell component on only certain microbes, whereas a broad spectrum is going to target one of the components common to most pathogens. And so you're going to see broad versus narrow. And again, when you're talking about drug of choice, you'd rather hit a broad spectrum versus a narrow spectrum because you want to make sure if you're not really sure what the pathogen is, but you're taking a shot in the dark saying, well, I know it's gram negative, but I don't know which one. You'd rather give a broad spectrum that you know it's going to affect all the gram negatives rather than just give a drug that's going to be a target for, let's say, pseudomonas or something like that. Okay, you want unless you know it's pseudomonas, then you want to make sure that you have more of a broad spectrum. So you want to get rid of that organism, if that makes sense. All right, so let's answer this question. A drug that targets lipopolysaccharides in the gram negative cell would be considered what? A broad spectrum, a narrow spectrum, selectively toxic, a broad spectrum and selectively toxic, or narrow spectrum and selectively toxic. So again, kind of knowing some of your definitions will help. Selectively toxic means it's only found on microbes, not found on us. And then broad is lots of bacteria versus narrow, which would be very few bacteria. So what do you think this one would be? All right, if you answer D, broad spectrum and selectively toxic, I would give you the credit. They also, I think, you know, because they use the example of gram negative, but I think because most, we're talking about all gram negatives having LPS, I would say it would be the broad spectrum and selectively toxic. If you said narrow spectrum, I'd probably give it to you too, because it's hard to determine what do they mean by broad versus negative. I would say that's pretty broad if you're targeting all gram negatives and lipopolysaccharide, because all gram negatives have that. So I would say it's probably a broad spectrum there. Okay, if you got it, good job. If you didn't, don't fret. We're going to see how this all works out, but I think you're probably on the right track. All right, so the first group we're going to look at is drugs that affect the cell wall. Okay, and again, most bacteria cells have peptidoglycan, so penicillins and cephalosporins are going to go and block peptidoglycan. Makes sense. If you got that's the most important component in the cell wall, we're going to have drugs that block that component. It works on active and young growing cells. And again, the problem is with a lot of these drugs is that penicillins don't penetrate the outer membrane and are less effective in gram negative. So again, penicillins are going to be more for the gram positive bacteria rather than gram negative. And again, when we start talking about gram positive, gram negative bacteria, we'll also talk about what antibiotics work better for them. There are some broad spectrum penicillins and cephalosporins, and you've probably taken them. Amoxicillin is one of those. They target both gram positive and gram negative. What they've done is 
eliminated that uh, poor solubility in the gram-negative membrane that allows it to get in and actually be effective against gram-negatives as well. So like amoxicillin, a really good broad spectrum drug. Okay, so that's one of those that would be good for a lot of different things. All right, so that's kind of the idea. All right, so what does penicillin do? And so we can look at it a number of different ways. So think of the gram or think of the cell wall as a series of bricks. Okay, so when we're talking about the gram positive bacteria, remember the gram positive have those really thick cell walls. They're stacked by these big series of brick like structures. It's NAM and NAG, and this is the peptidoglycan. Okay, and those go together. What happens is, is penicillin comes in and breaks these linkages between the NAM and NAG. And so all these things are targeted. And essentially what you're doing is breaking those linkages and causing holes to form. And so you break it and make it weak. So it's kind of like taking a, a jackhammer and shoving, you know, and breaking out all the mortar and busting all the mortar out between the bricks. Once that happens, the bricks become loose and then they fall out. Now you got holes in the brick wall. And that's essentially what you're doing here. So you can see here's the cell up here. You expose it to penicillin. What it does is it pokes the holes in the wall. Just like I said, you kind of poke at the mortar to scrape out and get the bricks loose. The bricks fall out, and now the poor little guy gets uh, broken apart because it can't handle the osmotic pressure as well. So this is where, again, you go from salt water to, to uh, more fresh water. You treat more fresh water. The cells can't handle that change. Water rushes in, and it all bursts. Okay? And essentially, this is what happens here. And so that's what happens to the cell. And here's a really neat example. You can see here are the bacteria here. This is what happens when they're treated with uh, penicillin. And you can see they're starting to ooze their insides. And that's what happens when they take penicillin. Now, again, the key is that these cells have to be metabolically active because they got to be making these walls. What it essentially does is the penicillin gets in and puts linkages or stops the linkages between these walls and they have to be being built during when they're being built it doesn't work so well when they're already built and so it really doesn't do a lot when they're old dead or not dead cells but old uh, cell wall kind of cells okay or cell wall kind of cells cells that have uh solid cell walls okay so it's really going after the young cells that are growing and making new cell walls and that's where the linkages stop so that's the key okay all right so what do, what do we call these drugs? They're called beta-lactam. And the beta-lactam is a ring that, that targets the penicillin, or that targets basically the um, NAM and NAG of the cell walls, okay? So what it does is it interferes with the cell wall synthesis. It blocks the linkages between the NAM and NAG. And again, more than half of our antibiotics are beta-lactams, meaning they, it's what they target. And I'd say probably it's closer to 60% of all our antibiotics are actually these beta-lactam drugs that go after the cell wall, okay? And the most prominent are penicillins and cephalosporins. And probably all of us have at least taken one of these in our lifetime. If you haven't taken an antibiotic, then you are probably you probably have been lucky. But uh, in most cases, you probably haven't had a serious enough infection. But I'm sure at one point in our time, in our lives, we've at least taken one of these antibiotics. Now, some of us have allergies to those things, and that's a whole other thing. We'll talk about that uh, down the road. But... Right now, these are the types of drugs that we think about and what we take when we have an infection, okay? Here's the beta-lactam ring right here. These are the common structures, and this is going to be important when we start talking about uh, resistance. And so we'll look at resistance here in a little bit and what that means, but this is the key component, this beta-lactam. So you can kind of see it's a box with this pentagon ring next to it. And so we'll look at these things again and talk about it. And that's the, that's the ring that plays a huge role in breaking the NAM and NAG down, okay? And so again, uh, getting the natural penicillin and that stuff, and you can see the different derivatives are based on the different R groups they have on the sides, uh, but the beta-lactam is the same. All right, here shows you a number of the different types of drugs that are available. Again, you may have taken some of these, and you can see, is it the difference between a narrow spectrum versus the broad? And again, the penicillin is normally for uh, sensitive bacteria, again, gram positive and that stuff. When you're talking broad, this goes after gram negative and gram positive a lot of times, and you can see the difference. And so the ones you typically get in the doctor's office is going to either be ampicillin or amoxicillin. Sometimes you get carbenicillin, but they're all pretty much the same in what they do. And you may have some of these newer drugs. And again, you might see these, but essentially 
this is with pseudomonas and that stuff. So it all depends on the type of infection. So that's why it's important to get a gram stain done with your patient samples first. That's the first test you order up because you need to know what you're treating in order to figure out how to treat it. All right, another group is the cephalosporins. And again, you can see the beta-lactam ring is a little bit different. And this time, instead of a penta, a penta ring, you have now a hexagon here. And so it's a little bit different. Again, a lot of times people uh, will take cephalosporins if they're allergic to penicillin because it, it's less uh, allergies. And the other nice thing is that bacteria are less resistant to these guys. And so you see these a lot of times. And if it has the root uh, ceph in there or kef, that's representative of a cephalosporin. Okay, so cephalosporin does the same mode of action, goes in, dis uh, disturbs the, grand, or the cell walls, breaks them apart, and makes the cells leaky, okay? So same thing as penicillin in this case. All right, some other beta-lactam rings are the carbenopams, and again, these are some of the drugs. It's a broad-spectrum drug. The monobactams is another one that is there, and again, this is a more narrow spectrum, four gram negative aerobic bacilli, and again, this is for people with allergies. So if you have allergies to penicillin, you're probably gonna get a different type of drug that does very similar things without the allergies or the side effects. The reason why they always go to amoxicillin first is because it's very cheap. And it's cheap and easy to give to your patient without causing lots of problems, except if you're allergic. Then it then it opens a new whole can of worms in that sense of which one do you use to treat with, okay? All right, some other ones, vancomycin. Now this is a non-beta-lactam, but vancomycin actually targets the cell walls. And so again, these are used in the most severe cases of infections. These are This is kind of the drug of last resort. And this drug will go in and destroy those really thick cell walls. So one of the problems with MRSA, and we'll talk about this when we get into the staph infections, MRSA just has these enormously thick cell walls. The problem is penicillin, ampicillin, those things can't get through that cell wall. Vancomycin can, it still has a solubility that can get through that cell wall and break it open. Unfortunately, most of the other drugs can't and that's where the problem arises, okay? So, and it's hard to administer, so it's not the easiest drug and we wanna save some drugs so that we don't develop resistance to them. So that's another thing. Another one that's out there is bacitracin. And so you're probably familiar with this because this is one of those triple antibiotic ointment things. And so if you take uh, the Neosporin or your, uh, again, for cuts and scrapes and that stuff, some of your topicals, one of the main drugs is bacitracin. And we're gonna actually use this again uh, when we test staph and strep because it does a really good job of killing these guys. And so that's why it's a topical agent because a lot of times that's where you're gonna get these infections on your hands and on your, on your skin. And so topical ointments with bacitracin does a really good job of getting rid of staph, okay? Azonazid is another one that is uh, going in with mycolic acid uh, synthesis. So this is primarily used to treat TB or tuberculosis. And so this is going to be included along with a group of probably two or three other antibiotics. So there's a group of about 12 antibiotics they can choose from, and they normally do two or three to make sure that they get a broad range of antibiotics when they're treating for TB. So that's something we'll talk about when we get into TB as well. Okay, uh, the next ones are looking at drugs that break down the cell membrane. And so the cell membrane is underneath the cell wall, and there are a few drugs that do, do pretty well with this. The one is the polymyxins, and again, polymyxins cause leakage in gram-negative bacteria because they only have that really thin cell wall. They're not really effective um, in, in a lot of treatments. And again, they can have some toxicity issues because we have very similar cell walls. And so it's not the best, not the best drug of choice uh, for those cases, but there are some drugs out there with polymyxins in it. And again, those will go after the cell membranes. The other drug that's out there is this anthracetin B and nystatin. And these are for fungal infections. And what they do is they target sterols sterols that are on the fungal membranes. And so again, we don't have these sterols that are there. And so these work really well. So most of the fungal treatments that are out there, so if you have a tube of fungal cream at home, I want you to look at that and see. They primarily have these two chemicals in it, the anthracetin B and the nystatin, because they work really well. And we haven't seen a lot of resistance from the fungus yet. So that's a good thing. And again, these target the sterols that are found in the fungus 
that are not found in us. And so they, again, cause leakage in the membrane and cause the cells to explode. And so that's essentially what happens there. You put holes in the membrane, it's going to cause it to leak, and kind of like a leaky balloon, it's all going to go everywhere. All right, and so this shows you the polymyxin B. You can see the chemical kind of wedging its way into the membrane. And what it does is it basically wedges its way just kind of like a wedge would be for uh, wood or something else and you split the wood open. Same thing here. These things wedge themselves in and split the membrane open. Okay. All right. And then again, we talked about the polymyxins and against a narrow spectrum and again, a unique fatty acid and, a, and therefore only certain types of bacteria, one of them being pseudomonas and those in severe UTIs. So if you can't clear it with normal antibiotics, you may be given a polymyxin that works really well. But again, there's some toxicity issues there. And so that's why it's not really given very often because there are a lot of issues with it, as well as being a narrow spectrum. Okay, some that now, some drugs that affect nucleic acid synthesis. Uh, again, it blocks the synthesis of nucleotides, replication or transcription. And so all those different things that go on, you have the chloroquine and the quinolones. And again, these block the double helix, the, the cross linkages in the double helix or helicases, which prevent it from opening up. If you can't open up your DNA, you can't make copies. So this makes a lot of sense. These are drugs like uh, ciprofloxin and levaquin. So these are both drugs that block uh, these different nucleic acid synthesis uh, sections. We also have some antiviral drugs that are analogs, and you've probably heard of AZT. And AZT is a thymine analog, which again causes the, when you go from RNA to DNA with reverse transcriptase, it puts in the wrong T. The wrong T then screws up the DNA and the virus can't replicate. And so that's one of the things that we look at. It works pretty well, but again, over time, the virus overcomes this uh, misfortune and then continues on. So it's not like an end-all, cure-all. It works for a while, but along with other treatments that we now have, people with HIV can live a very long life, lifetime uh, with these different drugs. But this was really one of the first ones, these, these antiviral analogs. All right, another uh, drugs that work on DNA and RNA are the fluoroquinones. And again, these block uh, DNA gyrase and topoisomerase, which are found in all bacteria, but they're not found in us. And again, we worry about some of these drugs. Again, the ciprofloxacin, this is the fluoroquinolones. And again, we're worried about this because this is part of our biosafety or um, you could kind of call it a, a medicine chest for a bio casualty or mass bio casualty event. Okay, so let's say we have something like a dirty bomb go off, let's say in a big city like Chicago. That dirty bomb releases thousands and thousands of uh, strains of bacteria. People get sick, they die and that stuff, but who has to come in and help all those people are the first responders. So the CDC has set up these different uh, storage chests of different types of antibiotics to give to first responders so that they can be alive and treat the people that need to be treated so that they don't die from the same disease. And so one of the things the CDC is worried about is that over, uh, over um, prescribing some of these drugs could affect the whole um, storage ca uh, capsule or storage container because these get overused, bacteria develop resistance, and then these drugs that they've kept in these storage containers are now worthless. And so the idea is, is that now we want to make sure that we have some antibiotics that we know are going to still be effective and not have resistance to all these different bacteria. So that's the key. So we're not seeing ciprofloxacin being used as much anymore. If there are outbreaks, this is typically the drug of choice because again, there's not many allergies to it. It hits a broad spectrum of bacteria and so it works really well. So that's why they want to use it and keep it in this time capsule. So for now, you're not seeing a lot of it being used, but in the future, if we do have a mass bio outbreak or something like that, you'll probably see it used as again, a first responder drug and then given to patients to make them better. So those are the ideas, okay? So that's what we're seeing here. All right, and then we have some that block protein synthesis. And again, we target the ribosomes because the ribosomes are different. And so we have the two different types. We have the aminoglycosides. These incl include streptomycin, genomycin, and they insert on the 30S ribosome to prevent the mRNA from not lining up correctly. And so it basically blocks the mRNA from working. 
And then you have the tetracyclines that block the tRNA from coming in. And so essentially what it does is it plugs up the sites so the tRNAs can't come in to, to bring in the uh, amino acid. And so essentially you stop protein synthesis because you can't you plug up the site so you can't do it anymore. So that's some of the drugs that were out there. There are some other ones that affect the 50S and then also ones that affect both subunits from coming together. Okay, so again, some here are some of the targets. So here are the aminoglycosides, see how it affects the 30S so that the mRNA can't be uh, started in the right spot. So it's misread and it's incorrect. Another one will prevent the tRNA from binding. So this again keeps the, uh, the peptides from building and getting longer so the elongation can't happen. The azaldenones uh, uh, block, again, prevent both the uh, 30 and 50S from coming together. The tetracyclines block the tRNA, so those don't come in. I guess this one affects the chloramphenicol, affects the peptide bond formation. Sorry about that. And then erythromycin, again, prevents the elongation. So it basically puts a lock, padlock on the mRNA, and so you can't go down the pathway. And so these drugs do a very good job. And I said, like I said before, this is roughly 25 to 30% of our other uh, antibiotics that we have out there. So they're really effective. They do a lot of different things to a lot of different pathogens. A lot of them are broad spectrum. And so that's why they're used. And again, typically we don't have any toxicity issues, but our mitochondria have 70S. So overuse over a long period of time could lead to some toxicity, especially with your kidneys and your liver and that. So that's what we look at. All right. So we talked about the aminoglycosides already. And again, this is the structure. Here's a list of a number of different drugs. If you see the, the mycin at the end, these typically are the aminoglycosides blocking protein synthesis. So again, these bind onto the 30S and prohibit uh, the reading of the mRNA. So that's the structure of these guys, okay? Uh, again, with the aminoglycosides, these are from uh, fungal species, streptomyces and um, micromonospora. And again, they're broad spectrum. They inhibit protein synthesis because again, most bacteria have 30S uh, ribosomes. And again, they prevent the 30S from, or the mRNA to be read. And you can see where some of these guys are used, streptomycin, gentamicin, and then you have tobermycin and some of these other ones that again, are very effective, broad spectrum, and they're used pretty well. And again, we have very few allergies. There are some uh, side effects in that that are associated with, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but primarily, we don't worry too much about these guys, so they're used quite a bit. Okay, tetracycline, these block protein synthesis by binding to ribosomes, and again, this prohibits the peptide bond formation. Again, it's low cost, but they do cause side effects. Now, a couple of side effects with tetracyclines is that they can cause kidney and liver failure, which is always a bad thing, you don't want that. And then they also, if they're used in young kids and that stuff that have uh, growing bones and teeth, they can cause problems with that. So mineralization and that. And so typically we don't like to use this. You can sometimes see people that have had a lot of tetracycline when they're a kid because they have yellow lines. And this is not tartar from their teeth, but they actually have yellow lines on their teeth from where the tetracycline came and bonded with the, the calcium that's bound to their teeth. So that's one of the reasons why we don't use tetracycline. The other problem with tetracycline is it's not very soluble in water and you have to use alcohol to uh, make it soluble. So there's a number of problems with it. It's cheap, but it's not really used that often, only in the most severe cases of a lot of different things. Okay, chloramphenicol is another broad spectrum. Again, it targets the, the 50 and the 50S. It doesn't allow for the tRNA to bind. And so uh, again, the problem is, is that it's very toxic because again, we have the 70S ribosomes in our mitochondria can cause damage to bone marrow and other things. And so again, only in cases where we have some severe, nasty infections that we know uh, it could be life and death, do we use this drug? It wouldn't be given to some simple random infection. It's gonna be something that's gonna be life and death. You know, it doesn't matter if you're dead, whether you get some of these side effects because you know, if they wanna try and keep you alive. So this will be used as a last resort type of drug is again, life and death type of situation. Okay. Now, some of the other uh, uh, antibiotics are the microlides, and these are erythromycin. And again, these block and attach to the 50S. And so the, a lot of times these prevent the clamping of the two together. And so again, we talk about erythromycin and some of these other ones. 
that are produced. You can see there's a broad spectrum, low toxicity, so they're used for a lot of different drugs. And again, some are for used for penicillin resistant bacteria like syphilis and gonococci and acne. And then there are some new semi-synthetic and again, the azithromycin or chlorithromycin, these are new drugs that are based on the erythromycin uh, structure. And so again, these might be some of the newer ones that are down the road where we start to find resistance with the penicillins and other things. We may be turning to the macrolades and that to look at these things. Okay, and again, you see the macrolade, this kind of relates to protein synthesis. So these guys are all in protein synthesis. And again, I'm not gonna ask for specific, does this, hit the 30 or the 50 or anything like this, I just want you to know that it targets protein synthesis, okay? And if you see mycin, you know right away. Mycin, you think of protein synthesis, okay? All right, now the sulfonamides are another drug that affects protein or affects metabolic pathways. So this is something we didn't see in the chemical uh, things before. These guys go in and they affect the pathways that we have when we're talking about biochemical. Now, one of the things I've said early on was that bacteria need to make folic acid. Folic acid is necessary, if you see here in this pathway right here, folic acid is necessary to make uh, your DNA, your DNA bases, your purines and pyrimidines, and then also your amino acids. So they're very important for a lot of different structures inside the body. The bacteria can't make it, you inhibit this, you prevent them from making DNA and replicating their DNA. Also, when you want to make transcripts and that stuff, preventing them from making proteins. And so this works really well. So we have these drugs called sulfonamides and sulfonamides work very well in blocking it. So what it does is that it's an in, in, irreversible inhibitor that blocks the enzyme. So you remember we talked about competitive inhibition? Well, here you go. Here's competitive inhibition at its finest. Here's the enzyme. Here's the PABA substrate. You can see here's the sulfa drug that looks very similar, has the same substrate bottom, fits in and blocks the enzyme. So this is a competitive inhibition. So higher levels are likely to bind to the enzyme and prevent it. So here's your example of competitive inhibition. And again, this can be um, a one that is irreversible where the drug doesn't come out. Once it's in there, it doesn't come out and then it blocks the bacteria, the bacteria die and you kill the bacteria. So that's one of these effective ways of doing that. Okay, and again, competitive inhibition blocks the substrate, we talked about this, and then the synergistic effect is when you add one or more antibiotics and that the sum does a better job than just one alone. And so that's the synergistic effect. And so again, what we see is here, they have the same structure on the bottom and you can see how they fit into the uh, enzyme. You can see that the enzyme would bind in this area it looks almost exactly the same side by side on the bottom, and that's the competitive inhibition. Okay, it fights for the same site. Okay, uh, again, the sulfonamides, here's a number of the different ones. Some of these are narrow spectrum for the folic acid, and you can see where some of these drugs are used, and that, and the, and again, some of these different structures, and it's all based, the differences has this structure, it's the R group. These are what makes those drugs different. And so you can see these different drugs that are out there, okay? A lot of times we refer to these as the sulfa drugs. So if you hear sulfa drug, this is what it's doing and it's blocking the metabolic pathway. All right, here's the concept check. So aminoglycosides are the antibacterial drugs that target what? Peptidoglycan synthesis, cell membranes, protein synthesis, and DNA replication. I'll give you a minute to think about that. Okay, the key is look at aminoglycosides. What do you think amino is gonna affect? If you said protein synthesis, you are correct. So think of amino acids, aminoglycosides block protein synthesis. They actually go in and they target the 30S so that mRNA can't be read and they prevent protein synthesis. That's where they get the name aminoglycoside from. And so if you said protein synthesis, good job. You're learning your antibiotic drugs. All right, here are some of the new ones that are out there. And so again, you guys that are working in hospitals may have seen some of these things and you can see where these are used for. So phosphomycin, okay, is an alternative for UTIs. Synersid, this is used against resistant staph and enterococcus. And dapomycin, again, is for gram positives. And again, I just show this. I don't expect you guys to know these different drugs or anything else. I just show this so that you guys get an idea of, oh, okay, I understand. These are some of the drugs that are used 
in the hospital today. And, you know, if you want to refer back to this when you're doing your clinicals and that stuff, this is great. But this just gives you an idea so that you're just aware that, oh, yeah, I've seen that drug before and I can go back and refer to what it does. But I'm not going to expect you to know it on a test or something like that. OK, we're not here for um, biochemistry or anything like that or medicinal chemistry. I just want you to know that these things are out there. All right. Some other ones are the ketolids. And so, again, these are a new drug with a different ring structure and it's used when it's resistant to macrolides. And then the xanolidose, which is the Zyvox, is a synthetic antimicrobial that has an interaction with the mRNA. And again, these are used for resistant drugs. So we have to come up with new drugs when we see resistance with the good old standbys like ampicillin and cephalosporin and any of the myosins. We have to come up with new drugs. And a lot of times it's basically these derivatives that we take off the second, third, and fourth generations. All that means is that each generation has been changed a little bit more in the lab. So it started as a natural component. That's the first generation. Second generation is a little manipulation of the structure. Third generation is taking that second generation and manipulating it even more. And then the fourth might be a completely synthetic drug that's been completely made in the lab. It's similar to what you saw in the first generation, but it's been manipulated so much that now it's completely synthetic. And so again, we have to keep up with this resistance because the more resistance you see, the less effective these good old first generation standbys work anymore. Okay, and so that's the idea. All right, so here's another one. Which of the following drugs inhibits bacteria by blocking folic acid th synthesis? Is it chlorinfetacol, erythromycin, sulfonamides, or tetracycline? So I'll give you a second. Okay. Again, if you think of the sulfa drugs or sulfonamides, this blocks folic acid. So we talked about the pathways. The sulfonamides have the same structure as the PABA, which fits into the enzyme. The competitive inhibition stops the production. Problem is bacteria figure out a way to get around that as well. So that's another thing. So we'll look at resistance here in a few minutes, but that, that's a whole nother, nother topic. Okay, so if you said sulfonamides, good job. All right. Now we're going to look at some of the other structures. So we'll take a couple minutes to look at fungal infections. We'll look at a little bit about worms and then finally finish up with viruses. And so we'll talk a little bit about those and then we'll talk about resistance and then we're almost done for today. Okay, so here are the fungal infections. So again, they're eukaryotic. So one of the problems with fungal infections and anything else that we talk about here is that they're more similar to us. So the more similar the cells are to us, the harder they are to treat because there's less differences, less things we can find that can be toxic to them and not toxic to us. Okay, so again, a drug that's toxic to fungal cells will also be target, uh, toxic to human cells, so we have to find ways. And again, there are typically five antifungal drug groups. First one is the anthracetin B and nystatin. We talked about this. This goes in and damages cell membranes, okay? It's the most versatile and effective topical, and again, any fungal treatment cream or spray or anything else will have these guys in it because it works very well. And again, there isn't a lot of resistance to it and they work very, very well. So that's what you're gonna see. So if you have a fungal cream or a spray at home, take a look and I guarantee you'll probably see one or both of these drugs in that. Another uh, type of antifungal drug, the, uh, the Grisfolvin. Again, this is for dermatophytes. So you've probably seen the commercial with the yellow nails and the little dermatophyte that lifts up the nail and lives under your nail bed and that stuff. Well, again, these guys are given to treat the most stubborn ones. If the normal topical doesn't work, you sometimes have to take a pill because it's on the inside and you really have to get in there. That's the drug. Okay, some synthetic azoles. Again, there's some other ones. The flucocytine, uh, flu, uh, flu cytosine, again, is an analog of cytosine that goes into uh, uh, breaking down cutaneous mycosis. So this might be another one. And then the uh, echinocandins, echino again, damage cell walls. And so there's some other ones. So typically we're looking either at cell membranes or cell walls with the fungus because, again, fungal cells have some, some walls. We don't. That's one of the targets that we can really go after in these guys. Okay, so these are the agents for fungal infections. Okay, some antiparasitic uh, chem chemotherapy. So we're talking about both parasites and we're talking about worms. Okay, for malaria, malaria kills more people every year 
uh, as a parasite than a lot of other infections that are out there. So when we talk about parasitic infections, malaria is by far number one. Okay, and if you live in areas that are in the tropical areas where you have those mosquitoes, there's always a risk for malaria and mosquito nets are probably your one, number one way of preventing you from getting it. If you do get malaria, there's really only one effective drug and that's called quinine. And this has been developed five, 600 years ago from the bark of a tree. And again, really we have not found any other medicine out there that really helps uh, not prevent it, but help treat some of the symptoms that are associated with it. And we'll get into more about malaria in chapter 23 and that and what it does. But essentially what it does is the parasite gets into your red blood cells, burst all your red blood cells. So not only do you get anemic, but then you have a very huge immune response from the busting of all your immune cells. And eventually that's what kills you. So we'll talk about that again in, in chapter 23. There's some other ones out there, some, um, sulfonamides, tetracyclines that are both uh, bacterial and antiprotozoan because they target, again, protein synthesis, but long-term of these things can be bad for you. And then some of these anti-helmethetic drugs or anti-worm drugs immobilize, disintegrate, or inhibit metabolism. So these drugs do all a very good job of killing it. The problem is that sometimes with these drugs is they'll kill the worm, but then you have to pass it. If you have this worm in your intestines, you have to either get it out surgically or you got to poop it out. And so hopefully you poop it out. Otherwise, if it gets lodged, then you're talking about surgery and having to get into your intestines and then pulling this worm out. So it's not a fun way to get rid of a worm infestation. So hopefully the drugs will disintegrate and cause these things to go away. But if these worms are pretty large in people and some of these tapeworms can be 30 feet long, you're probably going in surgically as well. You kill the worm and then you go in and then remove it surgically as well so it doesn't get lodged in the intestines. All right, some other antiviral ones. Again, the selective toxicity, uh, because it's intracellular, it's very difficult. So you have to get into the host cells that are infected. And so you have to kill those cells that are infected with the virus in order to get rid of the virus. So this can be a huge problem as well. So you have to target the host cells and that can be a big issue. So one of the biggest ones is blocking the virus from getting in uh, in the first place. So if you've probably seen the commercials for Tamiflu, Tamiflu is good if you take it early on. So you have to take it in the first couple of days of infection. Otherwise, it does you no good because what it does is blocks it, the flu virus from getting into other cells. So if you start feeling the symptoms, that's when you want to start taking the uh, Tamiflu. Once you've had it for a few days, it's basically ineffective because now the flu is in all your cells and those cells are spreading the flu faster and faster. So the Tamiflu really doesn't do you a very good job. So essentially what they say is take it early on and that will help limit the duration of the flu. But most, most of the times these drugs are very ineffective if it's taken late in its course. Okay, there are some other ones that block replication, transcription or translation of the viral genetic material. Again, acyclovir, you probably have heard this if you've had any types of herpes viruses. So we're talking about uh, chicken pox is a herpes virus, herpes simplex 1 or herpes simplex 2. These are the cold sores and genital sores that people get. There's also some other ones, CMV, and that acyclovir is a very good drug to take there. Uh, Vivarin is another one. It's a guanine analog that's used for RSV and hemorrhagic fevers and then AZT, which is one of the drugs that I talked about, the thymine analog that's working for HIV. So again, we'll look at these things again when we start talking about the viruses and some of the treatments, but I just wanted to give you an idea of some of these things. Another one is maturation of viral particles. So protease inhibitors actually help break down proteins. And so if you can't make proteins and break them down faster, what you can do is you can treat the cells, host cells that have the HIV with these protease inhibitors and you effectively prevent the uh, transcription, translation, and then basically the protein synthesis of these HIVs. So essentially what it does is prevent these things from uh, making and you can block HIV. So not only is AZT used now for treatment, but a lot of times these protease inhibitors, and like I said, these combinations of these different drugs for HIV have allowed people with HIV positive uh, infections, you know, Charlie Sheen comes to mind, that actually will live a long lifetime. So it used to be one of these things that if you got HIV, you probably had about 10 good years left in your, in your life. Nowadays with these different treatments, you can live 20, 30, 40 years without uh, really even feeling the ill effects of HIV. So it's not so much a death sentence anymore. That doesn't, 
again, prevention is the best way to keep you from getting HIV is the best method. But if you do end up getting something like this and get a diagnosis of HIV, I don't want you to go out there and think that your life is over. You can live a long, full life with these drugs, except now you're going to be taking four drugs every day of your life, but it's going to keep you alive. Okay, so that's one of the things. So it's not as bleak anymore as it used to be. And so that's one of the good things is that with these different treatments that it'd be nice to find a cure, but we haven't gotten that yet. Okay. All right, and this again shows you some of the, the drugs. And these drugs, again, help block the uh, binding of the drug. And so again, we've talked about these different things. So you see here, here's the Tamiflu and Relenza. What it does is it stops the entry of the flu virus. So again, these antibodies prevent the flu virus from actually getting in. So it has to be taken early, early on because you don't want these things to get in. And it looks like it also prevents, uh, it interferes with the virus assembly or the budding virus. So it prevents it from getting out. So again, you need to feel some symptoms, but you want to, don't want to take it very late in, in there. So, okay. So lots of different things. It can get in, block the entry, and then also the release of the virus itself. Okay, so it does a couple different things along with these other ones. But these primarily do a good job of blocking the virus from getting into the cell. Okay, here's a cyclovir, val, uh, valcyclovir, famclovir, and some of these other ones. And again, what it does is it prevents the uh, herpes virus from getting in and making the different things. So you can see the drug coming in, blocks the DNA polymerase. It will not cause the polymerase uh, to make viral replication so you don't make new virus particles so that helps with the treatment with herpes and things like this and so again it doesn't uh, cure you of herpes but what it will do is lessen the symptoms so a lot of times you'll see that it could be a much weaker outbreak or even a fast outbreak whereas you know if without treatment it can go 7 10 even 14 days without uh, treatment whereas with treatment you can maybe go three or four days with uh, with treatment with those things here are the inhibitors and protease inhibitors, and again, blocking HIV. And like I said, these are some of the different drugs that can be used to uh, prevent HIV, either making uh, DNA and getting integrated in or blocking reverse transcriptase. So again, a couple of these different things in there. Then again, I'm not expecting you to remember all these different things. I'm just, just showing you how some of these drugs work and how they're used uh, and that stuff. So again, you're going to be treating patients later in life and that stuff when you get your nursing jobs and that stuff. And so I think it's important to kind of understand how some of these drugs work. And again, this is more medicinal chemistry, but just give you an idea of the method of how these things work. Okay, again, we talked about HIV infections and AIDS. And again, the two targets for chemotherapy is in hit interference with the viral DNA it comes from the viral RNA, the analogs, the AZT, and then the synthesis of DNA using uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And so we've already talked about that. That was in that one slide and that stuff. And those are the combination of the two drugs that I talked about that you can go on for a very long time with HIV and not be affected by it developing AIDS. Okay. Again, here are the HIV showing you the different mechanisms. And again, I think these are all the same things we showed before with the entry. Here's for HIV at the bottom. I think I was just supposed to show you this. So I'll zoom in on this and show you the HIV again, blocking the conversion of RNA to DNA and preventing the DNA from getting in. So you block that here. And in number six, you block the um, uh, pro, uh, protease. That protease is used to cleave the proteins if you use in protease inhibitors. You can block uh, the protease HIV so you don't get the HIV protein not clipped. It can't make the effective virus. And so it's a defective virus and it can't be made. And so both these drugs, the uh, integrase and these proteases do a very good job of, again, keeping you alive if you're HIV positive because you can't make a, an effective virus to spread to other cells. You keep your T cells up. That's the main goal with HIV is you want to keep your immune system healthy so that you can fight all these different diseases. What happens with HIV is you don't die from HIV. What you die from is the secondary infections you get because HIV wipes out your immune system. Again, we'll look at that in chapter 15 and 16, and we'll talk about that more for now. I, again, don't care that you know all these different drugs. I'm just showing you how these things work mechanistically. All right, so if we look at interferons, interferons are natural 
um, molecules that we make that actually prevent uh, infections. And so we're using these more and more, especially in cancer treatments and other things. And so what this does is that these chemicals stimulate your immune system. And so these are really good because they help work the immune system work better. And so when the immune system works better, we can reduce the healing time and some of the complications that go along with this with some of the drugs we take. Uh, we prevent and reduce the symptoms of colds, slow the progress of some cancers, and then some of these other ones, hepatitis C, general warts, and sarcoma, some of these cancer cells. And again, these all seem to be very effective using this interferon. The nice thing about this is this is something that's made by the body, and so it's a natural substance that you would take, you know, get injected with, you normally make this and then you ins insinuate or stem up the immune system to work in your favor. So this is a natural chemical. You're not putting something toxic in your body that you could have side effects like kidney damage or liver damage trying to, to uh, get rid of the chemical. These are natural. And so this is one of these nice things about this is that it's a natural substance that can be in the body. All right. So the last thing we'll talk about is drug resistance and why we worry about these things. And again, this is in response to all the different drugs that are out there that we take to kill the bacteria. Well, bacteria are smart creatures and they have developed resistance to prevent these natural occurring chemicals from killing them. And so they've developed genetic mechanisms that allow them to pass them to other bacteria. So this is when we talk about conjugation, transformation, and transfection or transduction this case with the virus and passing these genetic material on to make new things so that they can be again uh, basically be resistant to the antibiotics okay so that's the idea and so again acquired resistance this can be through spontaneous mutations typically so if a bacteria is exposed to a drug or something else sometimes they can spontaneously mutate and come up with these things Typically, though, it's through acquisition of new genes or sets of genes. So this could be through conjugation. One plasma that has resistance gets passed to another bacteria. Okay, this happens all the time in our intestines. We have lots of bacteria. They gain resistance. They can pass it to other species. So that can be a scary thing. You have a dead bacteria that has resistance that now has the DNA. That DNA gets incorporated through transformation. We talked about transformation. That's another one. Bacteria getting the DNA from other bacteria, dying bacteria from free DNA. The other one is a virus. We talked about this, the transduction, where a virus will infect the bacteria and then takes that uh, resistance gene and transfers it to another bacteria. So you can see... These are all natural things that happen in the environment. And again, when we set up situations when we're taking lots of antibiotics, we can set up these situations where these genes get passed along from one bacteria to another. And so that's the scary thing. That's why we want to limit the use of antibiotics so we don't have situations like this occurring. All right, here are some of the mechanisms for drug resistance. So the first one is drug inactivation. So the first thing that happens is that bacteria have made enzymes and these enzymes act like little Pac-Men going in and destroying the beta-lactam ring. So one of the things that are out there is called penicillase. Penic see the ACE? It's an enzyme. The enzyme comes in and chews up the bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. When this happens, basically destroys the beta-lactam ring. You've now destroyed the feature of all the penicillins. So ampicillin, carbenicillin, any of them. And if you remember, most of these guys have the beta-lactam ring. That beta-lactam is now gone. You can't use it, and so it makes it inactive. And so that's the problem with a lot of these guys that have the enzyme. So the first one is an enzyme that eats up the antibiotic. Second one is permeability. So if you block the drug permeability from getting in, it can't get into the microbe, you've affected this. This happens a lot of times with things like MRSA. MRSA, what it does is just builds bigger and bigger cell walls so the drugs can't get in. And so if the drugs can't get in, it can't kill the bacteria. Another one that does this really well is Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas makes lots and lots of slime and goo, and so that slime and goo prevents the antibiotics from getting in, and it no longer can get in, uh, can't get in. So permeability issues of getting into the cell. Another one is inactivation using a drug pump. So some of these guys have developed these pumps that actually, when the drug comes in, will get turned on and shoot the drug right back out again. So no matter how much drugs you actually throw into the bacteria these drugs actually then get pumped right back out again. So it's kind of like a bailing bucket. So as soon as water comes in, you have a bailing bucket where your sump pump pumps the water right back out again. And so that's what happens in this situation. Antibiotic comes into the bacteria, they pump it right back out again. 
okay? You can change the binding site. So again, when we look at some of these macrolides and aminoglycosides that bind with the subunits, sometimes they'll change the binding site so that it doesn't fit anymore. And if you change the binding site, you got that in, in fit, the induced fit, the lock and key, you change the lock. So you come in, change the lock, the lock, the key doesn't work anymore and it basically becomes ineffective. And so that's where we see resistance on the protein synthesis, that it changes the binding site for a lot of these drugs. Now, the last one, we've talked about the pathways and the alternative pathways. Here you go. This is where the bacteria makes a change in the pathway. You take out pathway B to C. Now we make an intermediate C1 and D1, and you get to the same product. So you basically bypass it. So you stop, even though you have these drugs that will block the enzyme, the uh, competitive inhibition. They say, well, poop on you. We're making a new enzyme to kind of get on, uh, go on through. And what it will do is develop a new enzyme to make the same pathway so now it can make folic acid again. And now the drug is basically ineffective because it now has this other pathway. And so you and you can't block that one. Okay, until we take another drug to block that pathway and it'll make another one. So like I said, even though bacteria are very small, they don't have a lot, they're actually very smart. Okay, they figure out a lot of different mechanisms in which they can uh, get rid of antibiotics. And these are encoded on genes and these genes can be passed from one bacteria to the other. So it's not necessarily these mechanisms so much, it's the genes that they have that we worry about getting passed from one bacteria to another that will make these different things that you see on the screen. So that's the important thing. So again, I would like you to know some of these. Again, I'm not gonna ask you to know all of them, you know, but know at least three of them when I talk about it on the test of how these bacteria, so this is a good short answer essay question. Okay, if you think about uh, some of the mechanisms, what are some of the mechanisms and how do they work, okay? What does it do? All right, and again, all these things are encoded on genes. These genes can then be passed from one bacteria to another. And so when we talk about conjugation, transformation, transduction, these things can be spread via these mechanisms to other bacteria. So that can be a bad thing. All right, so here is a concept check. So which of the following effects do antiviral drugs not have? Killing extracellular viruses, stopping the viral synthesis, inhibiting virus maturation, and blocking virus receptors. Should have moved this up earlier so you guys would have probably paid more attention. So if you wanna go back, I'll let you see it real quick, but let's see which one do you think it is. Okay, the only thing I really didn't talk about was killing extracellular viruses. You can block the binding, but there's no way to really kill the viruses outside. So none of the drugs really target the virus outside the cell. It's all inside, either blocking the virus from getting in or inside the, the pathway. So if you said killing extracellular viruses, you got it right. If you thought it was something else, go back and look at those slides that I had a couple of slides, like five or six slides ago, and you'll see the different mechanisms and none of them say killing it extracellularly. Okay. All right, let's move on. All right, so natural selection and drug resistance. And then this is important for those that take lots of antibiotics. So we get into situations, especially if you guys are going on and working in nursing homes. So sometimes we have people that are on long-term antibiotics. The problem with that is when you take an antibiotic, you're not only killing the pathogen, but you're killing all the good bacteria that you have inside of you. What happens is when you kill all the good bacteria inside of you, that leaves the ones that are resistant. Now, the ones that are resistant might not be the ones that we want in there, okay? And so when that happens, we get these outgrowths, and this is what happens. And so this is describing natural selection. If you take antibiotics, you kill the good cells, you leave the ones that are resistant, and eventually they all become resistant. That's just the idea of natural selection. You get the genes that will support life, okay? That's the idea. Why does this happen in natural selection? It's because we get these interactions. And so we'll talk about this. But going back to the super infection. So when we see these long-term people on antibiotics, they get uh, bacteria that are supposed to be there. So you probably heard of Clostridium difficile. It's a nasty diarrheal pathogen. It's a bacteria that gets in the intestine and causes severe diarrhea. in these patients cause severe dehydration and death in these patients. And so this is one of the problems when this happens you get these infections because they're on antibiotics too long. So this is a situation where antibiotics themselves can actually cause you to get pathogens. And so it can be a bad thing, okay? All right, so again, when we look at interactions between the drug and hosts, it's estimated that about 5% of all persons that take antimicrobials will have some kind of side effect associated with them. Major side effects can include 
damage to tissue due to the toxicity, and this is typically either the liver or the kidney, okay, because the liver does the detoxification of all the drugs that you take, and the kidney is used for excretion, so one of those could be an allergy. So there's a number of people that are allergic to penicillin, so obviously you don't want to get penicillins and things like this. And then the last thing is the super infection. So this is where you disrupt your normal flora. So what I like to tell anyone when they're going on an antibiotic, you're taking an antibiotic, eat your yogurt, eat your cottage cheese, eat anything that has bacterial cultures. Better yet, take a probiotic that helps maintain the natural flora. Because the antibiotic doesn't just target the pathogen, it targets all the good bacteria that we have. And when we lose that good bacteria, this allows you to set up things that can cause nasty side effects where you get these nasty pathogens that come about like C. diff. So like I said, if you're taking an antibiotic, take something along with it, either a probiotic or yogurt or something else that has these live cultures to maintain your normal flora. That's what you want to do. Okay. Good advice for me. All right. This shows you the super infection. So let's say, let's say you had a staph infection in your throat. Okay. You take a drug that's in your intestine, but you take this drug over and over again. You keep getting this infection. What happens is the drug targets the uh, normal flora that's in the uh, intestine. It starts wiping out the ones that are uh, the normal flora that normally prevent these outgrowths of these pathogens. Okay. What happens is you eliminate the normal flora. Now all these pathogens have all kinds of room to grow and spread. And uh-oh, now you get severe diarrhea. So now you're getting diarrhea from Clostridium because now the pathogen can grow that the normal flora kept in check. You've eliminated the normal flora by taking the antibiotic and now these guys grow. And that's a, called a super infection. Basically, it's an infection due to by, from taking antibiotics. You've let the pathogens overgrow in areas where your normal flora used to take care of it, but now you got rid of that. So now these infections take place. Okay. So again, some considerations in selecting an antimicrobial drug. The first thing you want to do is identify the organism that's causing the infection. So that's why, like I said, First thing you typically do when you realize that your patient has a bacterial infection is you're going to call it for a gram stain because you want to know do you have gram positive or gram negative bugs, okay? Gram positive are going to be one type of antibiotic, gram negative are going to be another type. And so again, this will be one of the things that you want to do, identify the organism so you can figure out what is the best treatment, okay? Another thing you can do is test the susceptibility. Obviously, if time is of the essence, you might not have a lot of time to test the susceptibility because you're just you're caring about the patient's life. But if it's not a critical situation, you might actually take the patient sample and test it to see whether or not the antibiotic is actually going to be effective against it. And I'll show you how some of these uh, techniques actually work. The last thing, obviously, that's going to be important is you're going to look at the overall medical condition of the patient. If it's life and death, if these people are on in the ICU on you know life support and that stuff, sometimes you know worrying about toxicity is not a big thing because heck, this patient could die if he doesn't get something right away. So that's something you want to think about. The other thing you want to think about is that um, you know if the per the patient's pregnant if they have allergies, other things like this. So you have to consider what's going on with this patient. And if it, you know, if it's critical to give it treatment right away, or if you can delay treatment so that you can get the best drug of choice. And so that all plays a role. And so again, you guys are going to think about this when you're going through your clinicals, but this is just showing you again, treating infections are just another part of the daily routine in a hospital. You get people with severe infections. You have to think about the health of the patient, and what's going to be best for them. And again, selective toxicity is going to be a big role. All right. So again, identifying the agent should be done as soon as possible. So that's going to be the thing. We're going to be doing this when we search for the unknown at the end of the semester. And again, we should really identify them before you start throwing antimicrobials. Now, sometimes you don't have a lot of time associated with this. If you're talking about bacterial meningitis, something that could kill a patient within 12 hours, you're going to just start treatment right away no matter what it is. You try and give a broad spectrum and try and, and treat it right away. But sometimes, like I said, it's better to identify the organism so that it doesn't cause problems. And that's going to be the big thing, okay? Because you don't want to cause these different things from occurring. So again, identifying the agent will really help in that situation. Okay. Now to test the susceptibility, this is something we are going to do in the lab. Now, again, if you're watching this after we've done the Kirby Bauer, you've already seen this, but this is the Kirby Bauer method. 
And again, essentially what you're gonna do is grow up bacteria on a plate. So this is where we want a lawn of bacteria. Normally I'm hyping on you to say, you gotta get isolated colonies and you want just lines of bacteria. Here you want a lawn of bacteria. You want a full plate of bacteria so that it can grow. And then what you do is you plate these, put these little discs in there and you're gonna look for either resistance or susceptibility. Now, the bigger the ring typically means the more susceptible the bacteria is, but there are criteria and everything else. And again, when we do the lab, I'll show you how that works. Typically, there's a range that we look at and that the bigger the thing, more than likely it's gonna be meaning it's susceptible. The closer the bacteria grow to the disc, the probably the more likely it is resistant to the antibiotic and the antibiotic isn't effective. And so that would not be the choice. So in this case, you're probably looking at something like this uh, Eronoflaxin because it gave you the biggest distance around this culture here. It's also, you also can look at the concentration. So the concentration can play a big role. So in this case, I would say this one is probably susceptible. Uh, this bacteria is susceptible. So this would probably be your drug of choice in this case. But again, we can look at some of these different things. It's just looking at it right now without knowing all the different drugs and the, and the different things. But this is one way to figure out what is the best drug of choice in these cases. Okay, another one is the E-diffusion test. It kind of works on the Kirby Bauer, but what you're looking at is the concentration. So you can kind of see, here are the different concentrations of the drug. When you give it a high concentration, obviously you can see it's very effective at killing it. As you work your way out, it's less and less concentrated. So you can actually see what drug is the most effective and at what concentration. So you can kind of play a role of what concentration is this drug really effective at. And again, minimizing how much drug you give to your patient is also important. So the less drug you can give and it still kills is better than giving a whole boatload of drug to someone and giving them a lot of problems with toxicity either in their liver or kidneys. And so again, that can be an issue as well. And then finally, these dilution tests work very similar. And again, it's kind of like what we've talked about before with the, uh, the different thermal death points and things like this, you set up a series of tubes you arrange the concentration, and again, you look at the minimum concentration, which you don't get any growth, okay, that kills the bacteria. So the minimum concentration where you kill the bacteria, and this tells you, in this case, the 6.4 is where you see, again, you still have bacteria growing here. When you have no growth, this will tell you this is the concentration of the drug I can get. And again, this is a micro titer plate where you can do many drugs at once, and you can see what is the most effective concentration for that drug and when do you give it? So that's the idea here. So that's the dilution test or the MIC test, okay? So one of these three tests are done in the microbiology lab. Uh, and again, we're gonna do the Kirby Bauer in the lab. And again, you'll see it uh, and how we do that. If you haven't seen this yet, if you've already done it, you know how we've done it in the lab. And this again is important to determine the susceptibility of bacteria to the drug itself. All right. And again, here are some of the different drugs and the susceptibility. And again, I'm not gonna ask you about the different susceptibilities. We'll play around with this in the lab, but you can see some of the different drugs and how much you have to give of the drug to actually be effective. And if it's more than 500 micrograms, that's you're talking about a lot. And again, Pseudomonas is one of those things that takes a lot to kill it. And so we'll see that in the lab as well. All right. And then the last thing is again, the MIC and the therapeutic index. This is basically measuring the lowest possible concentration to kill the bugs that won't cause toxicity issues in the humans. So if you get something that's very toxic to humans, you want to give it in the lowest amount of concentration, and then that concentration still be effective in killing those bacteria. And so that's the idea of this therapeutic index. And so you want a high index because essentially the way you measure that, it's the ratio of the dose of drug that's toxic. Okay, so the toxic to humans versus the minimum effective dose that will kill the bacteria. So again, what concentration would kill the patient that goes on top? What concentration will kill the bacteria goes on the bottom? And the higher the number, the better it is, okay? Because that means that you only need a low concentration of uh, for the bacteria where a high dose will kill the patient, you know, a high dose of the drug will kill the patient. So you don't want it real close because the closer it is to each other, that means it's probably not gonna be a very good drug because it's gonna be very toxic to the patient and that stuff. But sometimes you have to bite the bullet and give it to that patient because there's no other choice, okay? So that's the idea behind that. So you want a high index and I'll show you again. I'll draw it on here and show you that a high index is more important than a low one. All right. 
So the MYC is what of a drug that's required to inhibit the growth of the microbe? Is it the largest concentration, the standard dose, the smallest concentration, or the lowest dilution? What is the MYC actually measuring here? Okay, so the MYC is actually me measuring the smallest concentration. So again, the MYC stands for the min minimum inhibitory concentration, meaning what is the lowest concentration that will be given to kill the bacteria. So that's what you're measuring there. So if you said the smallest concentration, you got it right. Okay, because you want the smallest, that's still gonna kill the bacteria. And that's the idea. Okay, so we made it to the end. Yay, we made it to the end. And so we're almost done here. The antimicrobials are any chemicals that inhibit microbial growth. And these can be both natural and synthetic. We talked about a number of different types. Again, the targets of the antimicrobials, I want you to know the targets, so make sure you know these. And I would like you to know the drug families. There's not a lot of drug families out there. So again, and you can kind of figure out what some of these things do uh, based on what they look like. If you had end in an illin, you know it goes after the walls, things like this. The polymyxins go after cell membranes. The fluoroquinones, the ciprofloxin goes after RNA or DNA synthesis. Protein synthesis, the aminoglycosides or the macrolides, okay, those are proteins. The sulfonamides, the sulfa drugs are metabolic proteins, and then the antivirals are binding to cells or inside host cells. Okay, so typically I look at these five in here, the cell wall, cell membranes, RNA, DNA, protein, and metabolic pathways. So if you remember these, you're good for the test, okay? Again, I don't want you to spend too much time looking at those things and and taking uh, too much time going over those things in, in that. But I do ask a couple questions on the test about that. Okay, we talked about the resistance. This is gonna be important. Like I said, I don't you don't necessarily need to memorize all these different ones, but I want you to be aware, let's say three, three of the six that I have in here. And so pumps, thicker walls, changes in pathways, changing of binding sites. You could say um, the solubility, binding sites for protein synthesis, drug activation. There's a lot of different ones. And again, just coming up with some different methods of how these guys can uh, get resistance and that stuff. Remember, all these are encoded on genes and those genes can go from one bacteria to another through those different mechanisms, and mechanisms, conjugation, transformation, transduction. But this is what those genes encode for, okay, and those things. What are some of the problems with antibiotics? We talked about toxicity, allergies, super infections. Know what super infections are. You'll see this again and again, especially when we get into uh, some of these infections, talking about C. diff and other things like that. And then finally, measuring the antibiotic effectiveness. Again, identifying the organism is first. And then again, how effective are these antibiotics going to be in the ways that we can do this? The Kirby Bauer method is what we did in the lab with the disc the paper disc and that stuff. The MYC is looking at the minimum inhibitory concentration. And then the therapeutic index is what's gonna to be toxic to my patient versus what is gonna to be toxic to the bug. And you want a high index, you want a big number because that means it's not gonna be very toxic to the patient, but very toxic to the bug, okay? With that, we came to the end. Hopefully you made it through all this. If you didn't and you took breaks, that's fine. Take breaks, I recommend that. And a lot of times it's really hard to get it all in in one sitting. Uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, please stop by office hours or after class and that stuff, ask questions. And again, if we have time in lab, I'm happy to go over any questions that you have face-to-face uh, -face and that stuff. I thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.